what we're going to do is um, begin a conversation about what was the essence of 20s fashion. And there'll be some images ongoing behind us, and um, they are meant to just broaden our discussion, but also perhaps lead to some questions from you in the audience. So um, I'm just going to get myself assembled here. It looks like I have everybody's water, so um, <laughs> <laughs> if I can share it with you. Okay. So Jan was kind enough to bring some images from uh, the Brooklyn Museum collection at the Met to show the transition from pre-20s fashion in terms of silhouette to 20s fashion. So I'm going to just ask Jan to elaborate on that a little. Okay. Um, um, on your left, you see uh, a dress from about 1905. Uh, this is the Belle Epoque period, and this silhouette was perhaps the most extreme silhouette that of, of all uh, in costume history, because it really deformed or reshaped the body so that uh, the uh, the bosom, which was the, called the mono bosom or the powder pigeon, uh, was one bulk, and the other bulk was the uh, was the derriere. Um, this is not as exaggerated as it might be in the in the uh, in the behind part, but um, the. Uh, the the corset that was worn under this was very heavy, and it uh, it pushed the front made the front straight, and uh, did not separate the breasts, and then uh, and the, pushed the behind out, so the woman's shape was actually an S curve, and the revolutionary uh, designer Paul Poiret, whom some of you probably know, referred to this as two great semicircles towing a barge. <laughs> uh, so Poiré was quite uh, actually uh, instrumental in changing that silhouette, which happened in about, um, um, began in about 1908-1909. So on your right, you see a dress from around 1910-1911, and you can see now you have an upright uh, position of the body, a natural position, and the waist has ray is raised up to under the, the bosom, and the line is much, is much straighter. Uh, this dress is also, however, worn with a corset uh, that is, is more um, upright and perhaps a little bit more restricting and is not uh, shaping the body uh, in an unnatural manner. I will say both of these fashions were, are uh, very complicated in construction and very difficult to get into. There are many, many hooks and eyes, very diabolical. Often the hooks and eyes are actually sewn on an opposite, alternating opposite positions, so you have to really focus on doing each one. And there are many snaps um, and layers, and you have to find what snap goes with what eye, etc. cetera. So um, you really had to have someone dress you. And I think that's a really important uh, uh, aspect when we talk about what happens in the 20s. So this is what happens, uh, to, uh, well, about 15 years later, 1926, here, here we are, with a completely tubular, uh, unfitted shape that was prevalent uh, that we really associate as the shape of the 20s, although as we talk, we will know that that is not the only shape of the 20s. So here you have something that uh, has no hooks and eyes, that slips over the head, and um, was easy for a, a woman to put on uh, by herself, but I must say, dressing a mannequin or, or putting it on a dress form is another story because the dress form of the mannequin can't wriggle into a dress like a body can. Um, so those are the three, uh, th this is the history of the 20th century silhouettes up to the 1920s. Thanks, Jan. Um, I think that one of the things um, that was most important in the exhibition upstairs, Youth and Beauty, was to express something of the body consciousness of, of the decade. And it was, it was a highly important 
subject matter, both in high culture and popular culture, and underpinning, no pun intended, um, some of the new designs was this incredibly new liberated sense of the body, and it had to do with the way people regarded proportions as well as the desire uh, to see the body as something active and not restrained by clothing or by codes of social behavior. And of course, it was the first great era of dieting. And this is from an ad for a scale uh, where you see all these lovely young women doing their calisthenics and exercises uh, in collage on, on the top of the scale. So um, just by way of background, um, there were other aspects of behavior in the 20s that um, led to the refashioning of clothing designs, including um, the sporting life and the fact that people were doing more physically, more outdoors, more actively, men and women. So. I wonder if people want to comment a little about um, just the notion of sports clothing. Well, um, you know, looking at these pictures, the women are still dressed, you know, as women in skirts, but women did start wearing knickers like the men, mm -hmm. um, and they were golfing, they're fanatics about golfing like the men, and uh, it was not looked down upon or unusual for a woman to have a knicker suit just like a man. Their knickers didn't have the fly in the front, buttoned on the side, but that's about the only difference between how it was styled. And they would either, they'd wear a jacket, they'd wear a tie and a vest, and look a lot like the men did on the, on the, the green. Now, was that a transition, Lisa, that occurred from early just, to late? Like, uh, you know, I, I don't really know how it happened. Mm -hmm. I don't know who really pioneered it. I just know it was accepted, and, and it appears in magazines mm -hmm. and in catalogs. So the, the look was being sold. So obviously it was mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, they still wore skirts on the tennis court, but they were flying planes by the early 20s, and there was like the first woman taxi driver, and you know, it was interesting. There were, because of World War I, women had to do those jobs because the men weren't mm -hmm. around, and it started introducing trousers and uh, more sportswear into women because, you know, that's what history was dictating at the time. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would say that, that is just exactly right. Um, these, the sport that really Produced the was the impetus though for the bifurcated garments was was a, the bicycling which mm -hmm. became very mainstream uh, for women in, in the 1890s and you see uh, uh, photographs of women dressed in very ma manly shirts and ties and they had to have their garments had to be split in order to, to ride astride a bicycle even unlike uh, riding habits. Uh, you could ride side saddle on a horse, which women did do uh, up, up into the 20th century primarily, but you couldn't ride side saddle on a bicycle. So I think that was a, that was, uh, a big uh, shot in the arm for uh, women wearing, wearing pants. Yeah, and they realized it was comfortable. For I like that it's called over. bifurcated garments. So <laughs> getting That's a bifurcated. <laughs> the clinical lingo from Jan here. <laughs> so how did the the use of either trouser-like clothing or um, modified skirts that were either shorter or sportier in some way, I guess, or pleated. Like culottes yeah, style. culottes. Yeah. How did that relate to the viability of pants for women as regular clothing, not sport clothing? Were, were pants actually part of a woman's wardrobe aside from her not sport really. clothes? No, not, not in the be not in the beginning yeah. of the 20th century, but um, again, Paul Poiret um, in 1910, 1911 showed <coughs> bifurcated garments, which were called the jupe culotte, and you know what we refer to as culottes. Uh, they were very shocking at the time, but it you know the momentum began to build very slowly, and then tennis players also, um, Suzanne Langan. Uh, um, and um, well, she was. They were still wearing shorter skirts, actually, in the in the in the twenties. But by the late late twenties, um, uh, what was it? There was another tennis player whose name I was 
Helen escapes Wills. me right. Um, not Helen, Hel Wills. Helen Wills was yeah. the other one. Mm -hmm. um, Alvarez, I think, was wearing uh, wore culottes on the tennis court, but that wasn't until 1929, 1930. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, the introduction so, of the chinoiserie movement was pajamas, right. you know, and there was right. a lot of you know Chinese style tunic and pajamas. And I came just came across a photo of a woman in 1924, the Easter parade, you know, in New York City, and she's on Fifth Avenue, and she's got this fabulous chinoiserie fur trimmed trousers you know silk mm -hmm. pajama trousers and you know a tunic top and her you know this beautiful hat and she's there for the Easter parade all dressed up and that's you know no one's looking at her askance so it was you know I think it was accepted because you were wearing you know ethnic a clothing yes yeah. it was a bit of a costume but um it yeah, brings it was very us popular. to yes <laughs> the, the other uh, aspect of um influence was uh, styles, historical styles from various uh, foreign places including Asia and Egypt and this is uh, a spread from Vogue um, from the 20s and you can see where uh, very self-consciously aspects of both cuts and uh, draping uh, are being drawn from historical styles. So uh, one of those uh, features is the sash, the, which uh, moves up and down the body various years mm -hmm. uh, in, throughout the 20s, but you have this sort of belted look and the low waist, and um, I wonder if there was any uh, special significance to that. I mean, those were, those were hard to wear silhouettes if you actually get down to it. Um, perhaps you could talk about fit or how the, the sash moved and changed over the course of the decade. What, uh, the one, uh, one on the far left there, that actually her sash that she's wearing, because every catalog was selling this look, they actually called it the Egyptian belt. So, you know, that is, that is actually look very Egyptian looking, mm -hmm. that particular mm -hmm. silhouette. But anything that, and, and they did, actually would hug the hip and come in the front too um, and there'd be some ornament you know right there in the the G spot which was very interesting I mean, that's something that has yeah, a big flower continually or surprised uh -huh. me is just how indiscreet all of that ornament is and mm -hmm. it's it's usually such a pastiche I don't know if uh, I no, suppose I went right to the crotch exactly <laughs> and, and it was sometimes mm -hmm. really just crude in terms of the layering of stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that something that was more uh, restrained in high fashion and, and less restrained in homemade clothing? Yeah, or? Definitely, yeah. The couture didn't do anything quite, quite so outlandish or crude looking. But I also think it's interesting that, um, you know, there was always in, in the history of costume, there was always emphasis on the waist or the placement of the waist, but the waist was always defined one place or another. And I think this is the, and this is the first time that the the waist actually basically disappeared, or it went way around the the uh, around the hips, and it's sort of that idea of being completely antithetical, completely opposite to what came uh, before to the to the, all of the associations with the with the Belle Epoque and the uh, was old fashioned and the pre pre war uh, life really. And so, at the same thanks. time, it was, it was this moment of a very uh, athletic, slender, lithe, ideal body. So mm -hmm. it's, it's in a way surprising that the waist disappears. But then again, these were fashions that were very hard for larger women to wear. If you see some of the rare advertisements for um, the versions of these dresses made for larger women, they look pretty... Yeah, Sad. I mean, the illustrations are always very elongated mm -hmm. and very lean. But when you see photographs of actual women, you know, wearing them, mm -hmm. you know, there is absolutely, by 22, you know, there's no waist. So if your hips are wide, the fabric is on your sides is as wide as your hips, so you become this block, mm -hmm. you know? And it was very, very difficult for anybody with curves to wear that. It's not made for any kind of bust at all. If you're tall and skinny and have boy hips, you were in like Flynn, you know, mm -hmm. you look great and everything. But if you didn't, 
if you were short and you know no you know a little round forget it that's why everyone <laughs> wanted to be on the hollywood 18 day diet which originated in the 20s <laughs> and, well people who became more active and they were more sporting and they were out doing things and you know that led to all um everyone wanting to stay fit to look wonderful in these new chemise shapes where mm -hmm. and the influence of of um, the androgynous look, where but, the girl looked more like a yeah, boy. Yeah, exactly. In fact, they called the flapper in France garçon. garçon. Yeah, mm -hmm. isn't that funny? Men, the men's word, no. the men, the word <laughs> for <laughs> men in, in French. And it was a look of, like a boy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was, yeah. With the short yeah. hair, too. Right. Yes. And yeah, youth. Exactly. Was, this is something we, we had talked about. Right. Um, the, the notion of youth being the ideal. And I, it's part of the content of the exhibition as well. There was this sense that youth held all of this promise. And it held physical ideals and uh, just sort of a higher, um, a higher existence, this sort mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. ideal period of one's life. What's occurred to me in just learning about fashion in the 20s, and I, I know all of you can speak to this, is that there was such incredible variety. We know in our sort of hackneyed view of the typical uh, Halloween flapper dress, one thing, and mm -hmm. it is like rigidly associated mm -hmm. with the 20s, but when you start looking through the journals, through the magazines, you see so many different silhouettes, so many different um, shapes and hemlines and then again you have the sort of shifts year by year or two years by two years. I chose just sort of as brackets for our conversation um, uh, Vogue pages. Um, actually the one on the left is from Altman's, from Altman's catalog from 21 and on the right is uh, a Vogue page from 28 and you do see the disappearance of this sort of backward looking um, turn of the century um, shape. That you see uh, on the left where the waist is more where it originally mm -hmm. was. Um, but look at the variety in the right in terms of uh, pleating versus the layered scalloping. And uh, I think that was a revelation to me, just how varied the shapes could be um, over the course of the decade. Yeah, I mean, we say in our shop, it's like, it was anything goes. I mean, once you really start looking at all the research, they tried every kind of design element possible. A lot of times it was very garish, you know, and terrible. But anything that was coming out of France, any kind of design, you know, the Americans were desperately trying to yeah. knock off and reproduce <laughs> and get on the backs of women for, you know, $12.98. So, you know, they tried everything, all the bells and whistles, because they saw it in Paris Magazine, so it must be good, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but all of it together. And it so was primarily funny. from Paris, correct, that, that these fashion shifts are coming. Yes, absolutely. Paris was the capital, and uh, as much as Americans would li liked, were always looking for their own indigenous style, it was, it was, it was Paris that everyone looked to. But there, there, there were basically, I would say, two strains of costume or design in the 20s, and one was this streamlined uh, shape that that built over the over the decade and was whom we associate a lot with uh, with Gabriel Chanel of course and then the other was a romantic romantic look with full skirts that's, and you see both of those on that page on um, the full skirted um, there was uh, in, in particular Jean Lanvin was uh, the proponent of these the more romantic styles. Um, and there was a particular style called the robe de steel, which had very, uh, very full skirts, were usually ankle length, and had side hoops, sort of like 18th century dresses. Um, like and that was a days. dress that, yeah. so, and you know, this dress here, you have lots of ruffles and more fabric, so they coexisted. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to tap into Lisa's. Um, life a little here uh, to talk a bit about some dresses she selected that are from the shop for yeah. Boardwalk. Correct? Yeah, just, I, just to illustrate how quickly 
the waistline changed mm -hmm. in the 20s. I mean, it was really pretty revolutionary how the look just went from old fashioned to completely a 20th century modern woman in a, a span of just a very few years. It's pretty amazing. This dress here, um, I'm sorry, it is a little dark on your left. You can't really see the detail. Could but we there, have the lights down a little, Asaro, just on the, yeah. That's there's, good. you know, it's purple chiffon. It's a, a better day dress, like for a luncheon or something, um, summer. And there's a sash that goes exactly at the waist. Uh, you know, it has an under piece built in that you can't see that snaps and hooks up the side that's linen that holds the bust in and then there's the chiffon that goes over it for the drape um, and it's long it would hit you like right up you know above the ankles like yeah. low and that was you know like 1918 and still played up until 1920 easily you wouldn't no one would look askance at you if you were wearing that mm -hmm. and and then you see the, this is only about 22, okay? So it goes right back down the hips. It's still long because, which was a tough, very tough look to wear because, you know, if you were short, definitely you had to be tall. So not only did the hip, did it go down the hips, but then it was long also. Um, the beading, the heavy, heavy beading on the chiffon, the, the kind of tubular look, bare arms, there's absolutely no under piece holding you in. It's just chiffon fabric with beading on it. And um, the little sash at the, at the sash at the hip. So the whole thing was just slipped on. Just and there slipped was no on way on. to. No, it's just there's no side, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And you, you were costuming the first season for 1920, correct? Yes. So you so could we, go we, either yes, way. Yes, we didn't, we would use, we might sneak into this a little bit, but only in nightclubs with very young women because Paris was coming out with this look a little earlier, hadn't really reached America. So it depended on who the girl was wearing this, mm -hmm. but it was like the real fashion forward set, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have one more. Fashion forward. Yeah. And this is what I call like true flapper. So it's all the way down the hip, but it's short at the same time. You know, they did a lot of this kind of handkerchief hem. It was perfect for dancing, short, kicky. And again, there's absolutely no underpiece at all. You have, it's all, you're all hanging out. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get to underwear in a little while. Uh, <clears throat> censorship, you know. <laughs> And then I couldn't resist. We have a couple of stills to um, show some of Lisa's artistry and uh, that of her staff, which we just learned this evening is 55 strong in terms of Yeah, when we're at when we're full tilt boogie, it's 55. Which is amazing. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about these two exquisite dresses? As I think they're both incredibly beautiful. Well, Lucy's dress on the left is it's a printed chiffon, which is she is fashion forward because Oh, sorry. I thought somebody was going to ask something. And um, so the length is still on the long side, but um, you can see it's hitting her more at the hip. Um, she was getting her stuff from Paris, you know, story-wise, because she's her boyfriend was Nucky, very rich. He would be ordering her these clothes. Um, she has kind of a, you know, a cocoon-style coat that's brocade, and actually it's it's cut velvet, and that part of the coat is original. It had old fur on it that was, you know, fur is, gets very sad after 100 years. So we replaced <laughs> the fur with fox, which is still vintage fox. Um, and Where did you find the vintage fox? You know, I go to so many of these vintage um, expos and shows, you know, the Metropolitan, mm -hmm. you know, vintage show is like four times a year in New York. And one of my vendors had this, it's like an 80s fox thing that we recut but it was beautiful fur, so. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had to reline it. And you can still find, you know, there's inspired fabrics still, inspired by the prints of the time. And she has more of a cloche hat instead of the wide brimmed that was still, most Early, women were right. wearing, yeah. And Margaret on the right, this is when she first starts working in the dress shop. And so she's basically like a model on the floor wearing one of the dresses that they would sell in the shop. But 
it's not on the hip, it's at the waist, and it's long. It's silk, it's a, it's, and it has a set-in sleeve, so it's still that old-fashioned styling, but there's some beading, some mm -hmm. decoration, and um, m much more in keeping with what a woman would probably buy mm -hmm. in America at mm -hmm. that time. And could you just say, sorry, Jen. I was just going to, is this about 1920 then? Yeah, it's the supposed set to be 1920. 1920. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it, her dress on the right is more like, the, 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 the silhouette is like the purple dress right. that she's wearing, yeah. Um, can you say just a little before we move on um, to some of the men's clothing, what the sort of proportions are to your use of vintage versus newly fabricated uh, garments? About like how many? Oh, okay. Or well, who wears the vintage? Who wears the new? Well, style? the background for the most part wears the vintage suits, mm -hmm. and you know, men's clothing, men's suits didn't hugely drastically change through the 20s. Mm -hmm. So we have a little more, more leeway with the men. It was more about the shoulder got padded and bigger, you know, mm -hmm. as you get towards, towards the, the 30s, 30s yeah. you know, pants got wider mm -hmm. and then they start introducing zippers late in the 20s. So we try to do as much button fly as we can and keep the silhouette Just skinny um, and tight because that's what it was for the suits. It come out of sack suits, you know, in the teens, but once uh, after World War I, the young men came back from the war, and I don't think they wanted to look like their dads or their mm -hmm. grandfathers, and it just completely, silhouette completely changed for men. That would be like when men started wearing the Oxford bags and yeah, exactly. the short sweaters for sportswear in That's college. That's right. Yeah, yeah. young, young men. It's youth, it's a youthful look. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't want to look like a, a banker and a bowler which was oh. what it was before. Mm -hmm. And that you had mentioned uh, when we were talking about the, uh, the soft collars oh, that yeah. came in instead of That's the... That's right, uh, because they, you know, they were soft collars in the uniforms in World War I, so when they came out of the war, last thing they wanted to do was put on a hard starched collar, which was very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. so soft collars start to become mainstream. Now, Nucky here is wearing a starched collar because he didn't, you know, he's the old, you know, the old school and uh, has a certain authoritative, you know, look, of course. Um, he, everything's custom made for him. He has the money and he has a tailor making all his things. So everything that he wears on the show, we make mm -hmm. because it has to look fresh and new and like it's made for him. Right. And, and the color is just sensational. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we talked about that because, of course, when you see old movies, everything's in black and white. Right. So you think, oh, everybody must have worn sepia-colored clothes. Well, that's not true. <laughs> and well, until you read about it right. or and get color catalogs or some sort of color something, I mean, they were doing neon colors. Some of the knits are yeah. so bright. It's amazing. And so where do you glean your color choices from? I mean, what inspires you to go in, in well, you know. I love color. John loves color. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for him, he's a bit of a showman mm -hmm. and a dandy. And it yeah. is a, it's a boardwalk on Atlantic City, you know. It's all that subtlety, that circusy <laughs> atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, he's like the ringleader. So, in a way, we wanted to, you know, make him the, he's the showstopper when he walks down the boardwalk. Right. You know? But if, if you recall up in the exhibition, if you've seen uh, Youth and Beauty upstairs, the portrait of, Paul Cadmus by Luigi Lucioni. He has this brilliant, bright green tie on, and um, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. If you think about just how important color was. No, it's a boldness to 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 get out of the Victorian age, mm -hmm. to get out of the black, to get out of the you know Darker to live. Time. It's yeah. all about life. Everybody was you know yeah. happy, 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 and it's one big party. So who now could we're. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone like their water? I have to. <laughs> we are now uh, going to talk about dressing from the inside out because one of the oh, thank you, dear. most important things about 20s fashion is the way it fits the body uh, in terms of a new kind of sleekness and um, a silhouette. And all of a sudden, the magazines are just filled with um, 
ads for, and really sexy ads for lingerie, for corsets, in a way that simply wasn't the case before the 20s, because it was completely inappropriate. And now you have uh, really long explanations as well as, why, as to why you should choose this form of undergarment. So you had these one-piece blousey things, you had uh, the two-piece, whether it was a bandeau or a more uh, shaped brassiere and uh, drawers, as my grandmother used to call them. Mm -hmm. um, but then on top of that, you would have your newfangled corset, which was an improvement over the old. So here are, here are your silky under things. And I love the fact that the brand is called Kicker Nick Bloomers. Um, and then you have the more supportive components, the elastic girdle, um, which Lisa has explained to me goes on top of your silkies, which is not something I understood. And then the dawn, especially with maiden form in the 20s, which is when I think it's Ida Rosenthal starts the, that company, the support bra for those larger women who can't just wear the bandos or the little handkerchiefs. So. Mm -hmm. um, Comments. <laughs> the line was always straight across and with straps to um, accommodate the style of the dress, which often an evening gown had this sort of shape or a V shape, and so it would be straight across. And um, my grandmother's bra from 1920 that I have <laughs> it was part of her, um, what she took on her honeymoon, was just a little piece of silk with two ribbons, straps, and no support whatsoever. It's all shredded now, but um, there were also, the pants were usually wide and called step-ins. Step-ins, mm -hmm. yeah. Step -ins. Mm -hmm. Like what we, I think they started calling them teddies in the 80s. Right, they made yeah. a big comeback. Um, but yeah, it's a, it was a step-in. Mm -hmm. And you know what's funny too, it, this picture doesn't show it, but if you look at some catalogs, if you had bloomers or you had, you know, silk bloomers, let's say, they would cram the top of the bloomer into the top of the hose. It was such a bulky, weird, like, what? It's like nobody really thought through all these layers, and, you know, it, it's really funny. And no wonder, you know, women rebelled and were rolling their stockings down because it made absolutely no sense to be stuffing your underwear into right. the top of your <laughs> stockings, you know, and the, the clips for the guard, you know, the garters for yes. the stockings are like right in the middle of your crotch, and you're like, how do you sit with that? Some some really odd, odd, you know, designs that, you know, came and went Things quickly. were evolving. Yeah. yeah, they were evolving. Nobody was really figuring it out quite yet. Yeah. Um, and the, the um, rolled up stockings was a place to keep your flask. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I, I think what's uh, interesting, though, is these sort of, you know, we now, cringe at girdles, even though a lot of people pour themselves into Spanx. Um, <laughs> but uh, there were these major steps in progress into the front lace corset, and then the rubberized girdle, which you see these just uh, jubilant ads for this new kind of material, the stretchy girdle. And you can imagine how wonderful that was for people. Um, they had to be awfully hot, though. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, women still took them off in the bathroom. You know, when they went to dance, they they went at the nightclubs. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, nobody was. Well, you know, could you check your around. corset someplace? Yeah. You know, maybe they're. You know, they had to wear it out the door, but they weren't wearing it on the Good dance God. floor. <laughs> yeah, actually, in the in the in the twenties, the corsets still were not. They had um, elastic inserts, small right. elastic inserts, but elastic. Actually, a full elastic garment was not uh, possible technologically to be made until the 1930s because they had to figure out um, how to process latex so that it could be made into very long strands. And that didn't happen until about 1930. So these corsets still are, you know, they're, they're still really corsets. Um, and uh, um, I was thinking before when we were talking about the body shape that it, Vogue is just replete with ads for corsets and the text saying it's about slimness, it's about making you slim. Mm -hmm. And ma you know that's what the corset was for. It wasn't reshaping as much right. as it was to make you look slim even though you, you weren't. 
So it wasn't your semicircles again. It wasn't your yeah. semicircles, or yeah. But the thinnest girls wouldn't wear corsets, correct? Or would they? So they reap the full benefit of the freedom of the silky under things. And you made um, an interesting point uh, when we had our little discussion uh, previous to this, Lisa, about shapes of women's bodies today and how the a lot of the women you fit don't conform to the kind of bust line that was acceptable no. or oh, yeah. common. Yes. And they're very sad. But <laughs> you know, we get when we fit background, you know, and we get somebody with a full bosom and you know we make we make kind of mass produce our own underwear so we get the right silhouette and there's no underwire and it's just basically kind of an elastic tube we put on them with straps just to sort of hold them in but everything goes south and they look in the mirror and they're you know they're just like oh my god no I can't you don't make me yeah I'm like yeah you gotta <laughs> and we make them but then the clothes fit them correctly otherwise you know if you're up in front it looks bizarre you know it, it doesn't work with the garment right. they weren't doing darts you know yet which is mind-boggling the, you know, the blouses were not darted so because it wasn't made for any kind of uplift everything Ooh, hung so lower you know so if it doesn't make sense for you to be out here it's just strange you know so changing yeah, ideals our underwear is very important mm -hmm. that is the foundation if you don't have a good foundation nothing looks good on top of it you know and the other changing feature, of course, in the decade are the hemlines. And this is amazing to me. Um, on the left is a group of dresses that are more or less the same in terms of hemline. And um, these are both from later in the decade. On the right is more of a, an accurate assortment of the kinds of hemlines and their uh, edging, um, I'm sure I'm not using the right terms, but you know, from these tubular skirts to layered things, and as you mentioned, the handkerchief. Um, Jan, is this something that was unique to the 20s in terms of the variety, if you compare it to the teens or you know, the first two decades of the century? Well, in, in the teens, there was a lot of asymmetry that that um, that was part of the style. A lot of sort of different um, uh, layers of things that that were were draped asymmetrically. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's not necessarily um, a new concept. I I would say, uh, is this from 1928? Yes. Do you know? Yeah, You're because good. that's when that would be my. <laughs> Because that's when the hemlines began, uh, uh, the unevenness of hemlines uh, became the style, and that's when hemlines began to drop. So they started dropping with, with just sort of one long piece of the hem or handkerchief points, um, or this, th th those are great examples actually, and then by 29 they really um, dropped. So. That was about the longest they were in the 20s, at 29. Yeah, 29 that's right. is, is they, the longest, that's right. and the yeah, asymmetric they, was a way of transition. Tra a, right, exactly, this transition was. Kyle, you remember you were talking about, you know, how the underwear was straight across mm -hmm. to look good underneath, you know, the straight across 20s dresses. It's because they were cutting the fabric straight. They didn't start doing bias until mm, later in the 20s, and that's point. another reason why right. uh, these kind of layers work so well, because they're cut on the bias. So they started doing bias at the hips, which is much more flattering for you know mm -hmm. uh, a nice drapey, flowy feel. But before it was just a squ you know, it was cut on the grain and not against the grain. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that changed a lot with the, the way the underwear was worn too later. I want to make sure we get Kyle brought just uh, an amazing array of um, contemporary fashions for us to look at uh, that were inspired by the 20s. I just want to take a very quick look at my favorite subject, the bathing suit, um, <laughs> because it's such a big part of the works of art upstairs. Uh, bathers and swimmers were a major subject for artists in the 20s, in part because you could reveal the body that way, uh, in a way that referenced all the ideals of physical um, uh, strength and vigor. 
Um, what we have here are early 20s and late 20s. Um, on the left, 21. On the right, 25, after you have the real spread of the California suit, which is the knit suit. And uh, early on, you still have these heavy cotton dresses. Um, notice as well stockings, hats, which, which sort of do continue. These are from Altman's. And what I love about this is, is they look fairly idealized in terms of how they're worn. I just want to jump to the real thing. Um, on the left, the early suits. On the right, uh, you can see just how uh, revealing the knit suits were. Um, you start to get a lot of these. Are, this is a group of Max Sennett bathing beauties. He had uh, these films of bathing beauties all the time, and they're just fabulous, always posing with some sort of provocative accessory here, the apples they're all eating. Because, but as you pointed out, Lisa, yeah. as well, you couldn't wear these off the board. I mean... No, no, you, there's no way. You, you, you would enter, you know, you come down the stairs and go into a cabana and change. And I mentioned to you, a lot of times you'd rent your bathing suit. Right. People just didn't have bathing suits, you know, your general public. So you'd be wearing somebody else's nasty old wet wool suit. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great and hygienic. And... <laughs> um, you'd have to go and change the cabana, stay on the beach, you know, in your swimsuit. If you wanted to go on the boardwalk, you had to be in clothes. Otherwise, it was considered indecent. You'd be arrested. And that the rule was in the early 20s that you were only, this was a law of some type that you were, you were not um, allowed to show more than nine inches of, of leg. Yeah. <laughs> so you had to have a, a boot or yeah, a, a, a stocking. stocking or whatever, and and only show nine, yeah. and you could be arrested. For oh that. yeah, but and they had beach patrols with measuring tapes, and they'd come and they'd measure. <laughs> the beach if they, police. If, if they weren't sure. Yes, they're and usually women in full length skirts. There's doing lots of that. pictures yeah. of you know, yeah. actual women being measured, and then yeah. there's a, a famous picture of like two women being physically lifted in thrown in the Huskal, yeah. you know, to be taken yeah. to jail because they dared show their legs. Yeah. That was the, um, the Kel Kellerman, um, the that, that's Kellerman a picture, suit, Annette yeah. Kellerman yeah. Uh, being hauled away in a police yeah. car. Oh, yeah. That was a she, very clingy one-piece yeah. suit she wore. Mm -hmm. This was a, a professional swimmer, competitive swimmer, who actually invented her own uh, you know, like Olympic suit. Mm -hmm. I want to move now to these beautiful photos that Kyle provided of contemporary designers. Here's our here's our twenties boardwalk. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, our uh, runway, yeah. excuse me, our twenties runway, and then we're going to segue to um, some of these images. And Kyle's going to talk about how many contemporary designers are riffing on the twenties, which. It's really a 20s moment, I love it. <laughs> so Kyle. These turning. are um, Mark Jacobs for um, spring, summer 2012. And I don't know that this exact look will hit the stores as it is, but um, you can see the influence on the, um, Should I move? on the right, yeah, move to the next one. How these dresses have, have a similarity of all the stuff that goes on sort of below the waist with the emphasis at the hip. Same Are these your photographs, Kyle? Are these your photographs? Um, they're, those aren't mine, oh. no, but yeah. they're from WWD. And I, I think what's interesting here is that he's actually celebrating all the bunchiness and uh, excess fabric that was typical of a lot of 20s design. So and he's used a luxury fabric, which mm -hmm. a lot of the evening wear of the, of the 20s was yeah. done into. Move your mic a little closer. Oh, yeah. sorry. That's okay. Here we go for some more. And these are also Mark, and I think the, the one um, on the left it almost looks like a 60s dress to me. But it's sort of channeling the 20s. You know, they get these all mixed up because those were the fun eras in fashion, the 20s and the 60s. And her hat, of course, is pulled way down like a cloche where it's just above the eyebrow. I do think that given what went on in the 60s with the short skirts and the tubular dresses, that it's hard to pull apart the references sometimes, but other times it's a lot clearer. Mm -hmm. I think this is maybe one of the most synthetic in terms of mixing the 60s and 20s. And this is um, Philosophy by Alberta Ferretti. 
She's taken the dress and actually make it, made it long to the, or the hem at the same length that it would have been done in the 20s. Instead of, usually today, when they make these sort of influence, they go very short, which if, you're, if you want it to look correct, it has to be longer like this. And she has the same kind of geometric folds. And the banding, and detail, yeah. And the coat, and the shoes. Modern fabrics, usually. Here's another one of hers. Very, very much the feeling. This is very sporty. It looks like um, if it was in white linen, it would be a tennis dress or mm -hmm. golfing. And you, you still have the lowish waist. And I, I paired it with this one in part because it had that sort of low belted look, but also um, the jacket came into use in oh, the yeah. later 20s with you know pretty fancy ensembles and dresses and, and the jacket was, when you think of it, um, that was pretty new, wasn't it? Uh, that kind of dress jacket. Cardigan, cardigan, yeah. That was Chanel's, uh, one of Chanel's yeah, contributions, definitely. definitely. Really that straight um, so great. hip length jacket. This then, is, I love this comparison. <laughs> this is uh, Ralph Lauren today, and he seems to have the hat Perfect. Perfect, yeah. And the colors, and you know, it's knit, and the accent of a scarf around the neck done in that way with a longness. Mm -hmm. Slender silhouette, though, too, yeah. Can't help it on those models, they're slender. <laughs> this is a, a, one of his other hats, close up at this is spring summer. And we talked a little bit about the androgyny and, and the tie. Mm -hmm. How frequently did women, was it a type of woman who would wear a tie or was it a certain kind of uh, event or? Well, the, wor the working women wore ties, you know, early in the teens too, you know. They, That's true, they but they're had, little they blouses. They had their own little detachable you know, collars, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, they were usually small waist. and embroidered and they'd wear their corsets, but they'd have a little black tie. With on. a midi blouse or something, yeah. You yeah. Bet. yeah. So what was different about the yeah. 20s tie? Anything in particular? It was a little more boyish, you know. As you can see, you know, it's a, night, a relaxed neck. It's like a boy's short shirt in the way... It, well, this know. one almost looks like it has a yeah. um, starch collar, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful photo. And um, these are Tori Birch, and she's um, done the sportswear look from the 20s even. Even the shoes kind of have the same feeling, the sort of golf shoes. Mm -hmm. And the geometric, I just uh, found these lovely ladies. Mm -hmm. um, that new kind of patterning, which was very modern. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then the long um, flapper beads, I guess they're called. <laughs> and there's Clara, Clara, Clara Bow Bo in It. The It Girl uh, with her sweater. Um, and her pleated those. skirt, which was good mm -hmm. for movement. And um, this one is Albert, Alberta Ferretti. It has that same detail, a little at the hip, with a flounce below for movement, for doing the Charleston, a mm -hmm. little sleeve. And these are um, philosophy for pre-fall. So these are brand new. Real 60s, 20s. Mm -hmm. yeah, short. It's hard to pull that apart. But yeah, they're yeah. very short. Hip it short, yeah. yeah. But if you look at the silhouettes and the influence, it really has the decorative um, details influenced from mm -hmm. some of the 20s. And look at the small heads, too. That really strikes me when you, um, yeah, the in, the, in the artwork, too, in the show, the very small heads. With the, I'm glad you pointed that out because, yeah, yes, so many really of the girls today don't have a pulled back hair. They mm -hmm. have it all down. Right. This really sort it's of very has that look. Mm -hmm. And these are Ralph Lauren again from his show. And I paired this just to show the, that kind of the banding of the ornament, the decoration. Uh, and the marabou. Yeah. Um, before I forget, I do want to thank Rima Ibrahim, who put this PowerPoint together. So thank you, Rima. <laughs> um, but now we're.
happy to open up for questions. And I, you know, there are a lot of topics we raise. It's, it's hard to do all of 20s fashion in an hour, but hopefully you'll bring up some of the things you're most curious about. So there are microphones on either side, and um, yes. Everyone hear that? No. Did social dance influence costume of the 20s or did 20s costumes influence social dance? Is that what you said? Yeah. That's Jan's question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, maybe a little bit of, of both, but dance was, dancers were the other very um, important influences uh, on the progression of, of women having more freedom in, in dress starting. Um, with the tango in 1910, um, there was a big out hue and cry at that time when women started doing the tango and showing their ankles and their legs and it was all considered very indecent and the designers started um, uh, developing special tango dresses which had more fullness around the, the knees so that the leg wouldn't be so indecently exposed. Um, and it went on uh, from there. Um, Irene Castle, maybe Many of you know yeah. who she was. Uh, she was a great influence, and uh, she bobbed her hair in 1913, and she was just the epitome of the, um, the lissom, uh, athletic, vital, uh, modern, yeah. modern young woman. And yeah, and then the jazz, where well, you talk about that a lot in yeah. your catalog too, well, um, ja jazz um, and the Charleston. Mm -hmm. Uh, which required became, a shorter skirt. Oh, yeah. So I they, think they that... Required, yeah, yeah, right. I would say that probably the Charleston did encourage the shortening of skirts. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, there are regular features about <clears throat> Irene Castle in Vogue and what she wears to dance because she, uh, she believed in corset-free dancing and also said that um, young women wouldn't have to diet if they would dance every night. So... Um, she was all about the kind of unstructured garment, um, but I would, I would certainly say that the Charleston must have encouraged people to wear shorter skirts because you just had to move your legs a lot. Well, the, you know, it was, it was a whole bunch of dances. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't name them, but... The black know, bottom for It one. was that oh, whole yeah. nightclub, you know, mm -hmm. kind of uh, scenario. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was jitterbugging. It was... It was energetic. It yeah. was the jazz age. Yeah. So it was, a, you know, they had to be free to mm -hmm. be able to move around. Yeah, absolutely. We, we have to mention Isadora Duncan, though, if we're talking about dancers. I was thinking Isadora Duncan, yeah. <laughs> in her Grecian robes, yeah. and everybody yeah. was emulating her in the, in the and 20s And heaven knows she was well. not into underwear, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe the automobile, did that have, yeah. Um, well, certainly the car coat, and for men as well, they at first used to wear these coats that were almost like lab coats, right? Dusters. And dusters, thank yeah. you. <laughs> right. So, but they're split, so you can easily sit, you know, Yeah, but that was, that was earlier, I think, yeah. in the 20s when the cars first came in, and they didn't have any protection, right. so you had to have the goggles and the hat yeah. and the, what, the duster. Yeah. How about gave, for women? I, I think it gave everybody more mobility, though, in general. Women had more mobility once the automobile came in, so it, they also wanted to be able to get around more easily, and you mm -hmm. couldn't wear those, you couldn't wear those early fashions that we, you saw earlier in, with any comfort getting in and out of cars. So, I think that these things sort of evolved in tandem or together and and the fact that women were even allowed to drive meant that they you know it encouraged a different way of wearing clothes and different clothes I think it's hard to do a sort of chicken and egg kind of thing but everything was changing I mean the fact that young people went off in cars in the evening boys and girls together leaving the home and doing their courting unchaperoned in uh, you know the the slang for the back seat of a car in the 20s was the struggle buggy 
and um, you know, you, you see it in novels of the period where this is, you know, a young girl going off or being picked up in a car. There was no telling who she'd be when she got back, and you know. <laughs> yes. No, you know, we we never use anything that's synthetic. So, you know, we only use natural fabrics because if synthetics just don't drape the same, they don't hang the way you know you want it to hang to get the silhouette that you want. Um, we're lucky in that uh, there is a lot of fabric being made and printed, and that's reminiscent of the twenties or inspired by the twenties. So it's out there. We have to hunt for it. Yeah, we have to hunt for it, and when we're lucky enough to find real vintage fabric, we, we use it also. But, yeah, no synthetics, only naturals. And now, in the back in the 1980s, David Batson was my roommate. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he's a good friend of mine, thanks. <laughs> All those cross-dressers of the 20s. Hmm. <laughs> well, you know, in fact, <laughs> drag balls started in Harlem during yeah. the Harlem Renaissance. And um, it was quite a thing. And as you know, a lot of um, whites looking for entertainment regularly went to Harlem, where, um, <clears throat> let's just say, codes of social behavior were less guarded. and. Um, there were these set venues, I mean, ongoing venues for regular drag balls. So I think, uh, and there were very famous Harlem transvestites. And this was something that was much harder to do downtown. And um, we had a great program here on the Gay Harlem Renaissance, and, and this is one of the things that came up. Um, so in that, in that context, I think, you know, it, it did occur, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if you read, you know, yeah, would you mind standing up and just saying the question, so it's a long one, I don't want to misquote you. Well, I think just as was the case downtown, anyone correct me because you're all very knowledgeable. Um, um, there was ready to wear, there were homemade clothes, and then there were high style things. And I'm sure there was all of that at play in Harlem as well because, you know, there were um, <clears throat> many wealthy Harlemites at that point in time. Uh, there were working people, there were um, sort of. Uh, creative people making their own designs. So I don't think it was monolithic. If you read some of the novels, though, like if you read any of Carl Van Vechten's novels, because uh, he wrote about Harlem a lot, what's really interesting to me is that the color palette was apparently very vivid in terms of what was in fashion in Harlem. Brilliant, brilliant colors. And um, if you read... Um, any of his books, you get a lot of those descriptions. If you read any of, if you read um, Home to Harlem, Claude McKay's Home to Harlem, um, that's another one where you really uh, hear about vivid descriptions of vivid, vivid colors and patterns. So I think that was one of the the keynotes of of Harlem costume. Anyone? I, I'm just, you know, 
any kind of bohemian or artist, you know, like it is now. There's really right. no difference in the attitude of, you know, you go into these village, you go into Brooklyn, young people put together, you know, style themselves in a, mm -hmm. a huge variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And I think because, you know, socially things were becoming modern so fast, I think that artists and uh, young people felt freer to style themselves mm -hmm. in any way they wanted to do and reinvent, you know, themselves and not adhere to what their mother wore, what their father wore. So it was really interesting. Got a lot of interpretation and a lot of interesting, you know, things put together. And mm -hmm. when you see photographs of these artists and I'm, you know, they're fantastic. They're just wearing whatever feels good. Yeah. And they look really fresh and modern and they could be walking down the street today. You would never even look twice. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. I think one of the things about the 20s too is that um, given the range of cuts and fashions, you could be as sexy as you wanted to be. You could be really outrageously sexy or you could be completely prim and pleated and be ribboned. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a shift because mm -hmm. unless you were an actress <laughs> or you know, a prostitute prior to that time, it was really hard to walk around in a very revealing dress, whether it was because of the cut or the sheerness of the fabric. And it was a lot easier in the 20s for the first time to do that. Mm -hmm. you know. yes. yes. The question was whether or not the designs, the fabric designs um, of Sonia Delaunay, who was a, a French cubist inspired artist, very much into beautifully um, wide ranging spectrum of colors and abstract designs, had an impact. Jan, you wanna? Can you? I can't say that she specifically had a huge impact on, on clothing production, but certainly those geometrics in, um, were a big part of um, 1920s patterning. Um, she, uh, of course, did make her own clothes, which are so fabulous. And if, any, if one ever turns up anywhere, it's this major event in the costume field. But um, she wasn't an influential couturier, certainly. Um, um, Maybe through you know, V&A. Didn't V&A pick up some of those Cubist-inspired designs? Yes. And yes. they filtered through. Right. Um, so it's sort of more of the broader um, artistic milieu rather than specifically yeah. Delaunay, I, I would say. Anyway. Yeah. I remember when I saw that show thinking, I've seen things that actually feel like they had been influenced from some of her design. Mm -hmm. Hats, textiles, the knitting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd say probably, you know, France was a big influence and, yeah. and the department stores knocked it all off mm -hmm. or, or did their interpretations, yeah. I should say. There was constant reporting about what was happening in Paris. and. Uh, something that was a surprise to me was to learn that there were as yet no real leading American designers in the 20s. And that's mm -hmm. something that's hard for us to believe because, you know, there's so many designers today and it was quite different then, right? Um, yeah, completely, right. It wasn't until the 1930s when some women designers began to get some traction uh, and some um, uh, uh, publicity, and then in, in the 1940s, certainly when we, when the world was at war again, the American, the first wave generation of American women designers really became influential. That's Claire McArdle, Vera Maxwell, um, um, who else? Somebody, a couple of other, uh, bon, not Bonnie Cashin, but um, um, well, Valentina certainly. Um, those women got, began making sportswear and becoming very influential. I can tell you though, getting back to Sonia, we're studying her book because those patterns are amazing. So we will be knocking her off. 
So I guarantee it. <laughs> what are you looking for when you look for new, like what about those patterns attracted you? And I am a big fan of her and her patterns. And I'm a big fan of geometric patterns anyway, because I've, they're completely contemporary, you know, and I love a bold statement like that. And speaking of Marc Jacobs, we've bought fabric of his because he was reproducing these big geometric, you know, patterns with colors that are great on like wool chalet and really interesting oh, fabrics. Yeah, that, you know, we're, we haven't really done anything with it yet, but, you know, we're percolating on it, on how to, you know, make it work. So you're always looking. Yeah, we're always looking. And that book is, you know, is fantastic. Um, and it's so fun and fanciful, too, that photograph of the car painted the same yeah, as her, she's... her fabric, and you know, so she's got the, you know, the dress on that's a fabric standing next to the car painted. You know, it's hilarious and great. You know. So do you do you ever buy or find actual twenties pattern, the paper patterns? And oh use sure, those? we have a yeah. huge collection of that, and it's really helpful, um, you know, to everybody in my shop to take a look at how the construction is because things, you know, they don't have the machinery then that they have now to construct thing, constructs things. So it's very good for them to look at old books and how things are put together say oh that's how they did that you know in that flare or this or that oh they cut it that way it's it's definitely helpful yeah. people might be interested to hear you were telling us about this new machine you bought recently oh yeah <laughs> we talk about it every day it's really kind of sick we love <laughs> on ebay last year we found a, a machine it's called a faggoting machine and it creates a stitch that um you know they use used a lot of chiffon blouses, cotton blouses. It's basically a stitch that has like perforated holes through it. And it's quite airy and nice and it really adds a lot of design element and a finished look to a garment. It gives uh, it texture. It gives it texture, it gives, it, it's beautiful. And it also, as I was telling you earlier, you know, so many of these old clothes that we have are so shattered in the shoulders, they've been hanging and poorly on bad hangers for so long, mm -hmm. and they're just destroyed. So that machine enabled us to sort of just cut out the bad pieces, find fabric, ha you know, dye it to match, and then this faggoting machine, we, you know, make it a decorative element and set in the new piece in the shoulder, and instead of it looking strange or just patched, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, looks brand new. So it's, it's a terrific thing. And I will never talk about it again. <laughs> They're not wearing anything. <laughs> I can guarantee you outside the brothel they were trying to look like that and they were, you know, when they put clothes on, they were, you just don't see it on the show. You know, and it, we just, it's about an atmospheric thing for us to do the brothel with voluptuous women because we had them spilling out of their garments. And, you know, it's like a candy store. You've got to have more candy to, you know, to, to make it enticing. So, you know, it's an atmospheric and a, you know, a, a directorial choice, too, to have it look a certain way. There was variety. No, there was, I mean, if you look at any of the, 
showgirl type of photographs. Um, you know, there was variety. So I think, you know. But you also have to talk about fashion versus sex trade. I mean, right. sex trade now is implants, you know, so they're still going for the big boobs, you know. That's not fashion. Women right. with implants aren't on the runway, you know. So it's, a, it's a, just a different, right. you know, aesthetic. Yeah. It's really not any different than today. Yeah, we all no. look at these impossibly tall, thin models who yeah. look fabulous in any kind of a style and think, well, that's not me. And it's not 95% of us or, or whatever. It's the same. It's the same. Mm -hmm. you see many <laughs> and we all try to <laughs> do different yeah. things to conform to that yeah. look. Yeah, you had the beginnings of ads for these rubberized things you were supposed to wear and sweat in, you know, I mean, it was just, it, right. there were all sorts of new inventions for compacting people and um, to once, try and... Once that's come on the scene, that tall, skinny right. silhouette has never, gone, never away gone away and ain't never going to go away, yeah. you know? But don't that you ideal. think that the, the 40s, the sort of 30s, well, the 40s... They were still the, slim. Yeah, but they were busty. Everything was up because yeah. they had underwire, so it was everything. It was, was all fine. engineering. Yeah, everything was hinged. <laughs> I think the body types go in and out all the time. I mean, yeah. look at when they were wearing bikinis. You had to have a shape for that. And 60s it, again. Yeah. Yeah. But and, still, and I, lean is in. Forever. What about the bullet bra? I mean, shapes go in and out, and even on a more subtle level, what models look like. There was a few years back when... Cindy Crawford was the ideal, and she had a figure. <coughs> yeah, but she's a lot still of real slim. She's slim, slim but then, yeah. but not straight up and down. Curves. <laughs> it's a subtle difference. I've I met the woman. She's not that. She's skinny. <laughs> yeah, I mean makeup. You know, women weren't really wearing much makeup at all until the 20th century because it was considered garish and lewd. You know, well, lewd and not in the Victor right yeah. in the 18th century they yeah. were wearing lots of makeup. But right, then, that's right. And then, it went and then to when nothing. the Victorian yeah but you, aesthetic you, came in, right? You do yes. have in the 20s the first real I call it over the counter the first mass marketed uh, makeup for the everyday woman who is not an actress. It's right. non-theatrical makeup. In the show, in our little popular cultural chronology, there's a tiny little deco um, eye makeup container. And this was huge uh, in terms of just the availability and the respectability of makeup. People like Max Factor, who started marketing. Yeah, you have a painting that, you know, of that idealized woman in your show, mm -hmm. isn't it? That was like the Max Factor yes. face. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you were gonna. Oh, Kyle. The, the the face. The focus was on the eyes. Mm -hmm. The eyes were big, Pen, thin penciled eyebrow. Tweez them all out. Draws a line and a tiny little cupid bow lip in red. If you had the big lips of today, you did anything to minimize them to a little heart shape, and uh, a little color on the cheeks, pale if you were pale, suntanned if you were sporty girl, mm -hmm. and... Um, That's right, women were getting tans. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But Hollywood was oh, the yeah, source, of because of course, you know, movies become what they are today in terms of, of the generation mm -hmm. of... Um, the icon that you want to look like, so that's when it first happened. Yeah. Well, we think of the the um, stars like Louise Brooks and and Colleen Moore having that cute, cute. dark bobbed hair, and um, and that becomes kind of the icon for that twenties mm -hmm. flapper, and mm -hmm. and um, yet Garbo was you know, one of the big stars at the time, but when she came over from Sweden, they all thought she was too fat. Mm -hmm. She had to lose weight to be an American star. Crazy. So there was, a, you know, there was a whole aesthetic look mm -hmm. from the short hair to the, the, you know, 
body that was slim, and the makeup. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, hello, Lisa. <laughs> The question was no. footwear. How much does it vary? What was typical? I think the heel got higher when it got later. Got a little higher, yeah. but, but basically it was that T-strap, T-strap, rounded toe style with the sort of a little thick, thickish heel. That was basically it. Interestingly, the the he, the open toe and the open heel did not gain any kind of credence until the 30s. There, every once in a while, there might be a, 20, a late 20s shoe with a, with a um, what do you call it, you know, a strap in the back with the, the heel revealed, but um, um, they, they were mostly closed shoes, like you think of a dance shoe now mm -hmm. with the with strap across it. Right. That was, that like was pretty Jane much it. with a French yeah, heel, right. or um, sometimes a two-tone shoe. Yeah, and you know, beautiful kid leather and silver and gold. And gold lame shoes, yeah. yeah. There was this one catalog that I found. Um, I've never, ever, ever seen an actual pair of shoes this style, but they were doing these double ankle strap things really early, too, and like triple ankle straps. Mm -hmm. It's really tardy, you know what I mean? And I don't think it probably went over too well, and that's why I've never seen it, but I was like, wow, look at that. You know, really interesting, mm -hmm. very sexy shoes. Do you think that was sort of <laughs> historically inspired as well? Like I, you know, I don't know. It was or, funny. It was yeah. like a 1920 catalog, and mm -hmm. they had these crazy amount of ankle straps coming off the heels. And I, I you know, it's it's garish. Yeah. Because it's garish now. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. It's interesting. So. Well, of course, those strap those, shoes yeah. were as hard to wear for the larger woman as the dresses were. Um, in terms of ankle straps oh, and the yeah. T straps, but didn't the pump come in by the end of the decade? Oh, no, the pump was there. Yeah. Yeah. High vamp. Yeah. Which I I love. I love that that old pump. Yeah. Yes. Lisa, you like the mail. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do, Terry. <laughs> so were, Thanks for saying so. No, you were, ta you were talking about how fun it was to work on the men's costumes yeah, I, as well, much as the women's. So. You know, it's funny. We, we're, you know, we're doing research for this new season that we're just starting. And like the women's stuff, with all the bells and whistles, mm -hmm. they're also trying tons of different jacket backs and pocket applications and you know again it's the same kind of concept They're like hey let's vent it three times and let's try a you know a zigzag formation and some of it you're like whoa what's that but it's really fun you know and we want to recreate it i don't know how, you know it's so it's based on things stuff. you've found oh sure yeah. and, and either it's you know salesman's catalogs you know mm -hmm. of the era or, mm -hmm. uh, that they offered this special back that they might have designed themselves doesn't mean it's attractive but it's really good for us for character stuff i mean it's a man's suit so how much can you do to it you know it's a tie what can you do to it you know it's limiting men's clothing once it hit the suit it's a suit you know mm -hmm. um so it's still the small shoulder and nipped in, pretty slim silhouette, but they were trying all different adaptations like single button, triple button, you know, double breasted, small placement, double breasted, you know, spread placement. And the placement. working man, was yeah. that different, the working man? Was you know, the working man had one suit and wore it every single day and it was made of some wool that was made of iron and you know, it was never cleaned and, you know, Got stood up on its own in the corner. <laughs> Maybe one more question I think we can, um, anyone who hasn't answered a question, yes, okay. Can you take I think a it was well, <laughs> it is a little bit. Um, I think it was changing um, in the 1930s. Once last 
last text was invented, then you could um, you could weave a whole garment with uh, with elastic, and so and then synthetics also became um, you know very uh, very much in use. So I think that's that's really when. It, so I think the wool there, there were still wool bathing suits in the 30s, but I think it began to change, and by the 40s it definitely had had changed. But just think about how how really unsafe it was, well, unsafe it was for women to swim when they were swimming in eight or nine yards of, of fabric. Um, um, and it was, they couldn't enjoy swimming at all. And so the wool bathing suit, the knit bathing suits were a great boon um, mm -hmm. when, they, uh, when they came in because they were just one piece and very streamlined. But then, then we think, oh my gosh, how can you swim in wool, you know? And it's interesting that those suits emerged in California where you had Catalina and Janssen, yeah. and it was a huge breakthrough. I think it was 20 or 21 where they were discovering this way to do two-directional knits. Right. And, the mm -hmm. and they, were, they were advertising these as suits meant for swimming because that was actually new. And you'd had all these professional swimmers doing the ads and little by little it became acceptable, but they were called California suits for at least three years before they were widely used throughout. It's kind they of had to emphasize the swimming functionality of it to make them acceptable right. because they were so revealing, there was so much skin showing, and so it was this fine line they were walking about. Um, the men's suits and the women's suits were actually quite similar. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the men's were had um, detachable tops, but you were supposed to wear your top. And um, there's a wonderful painting in the exhibit by Guy Pen de Bois of seen at the beach with the men's mm -hmm. and the women's suits that look very similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one more, Allison, am I allowed to? There's some, one more question. It was just about the wool. Did they just use that because it was only natural fabric that stretched, basically, at that, that time? Pretty much. Yeah, and Janssen uh, were the, really the innovators, um, uh, and they were, of course, working in wool. And the, the, the whole idea of that, that knit bathing suit uh, got started when Janssen was asked to create a rowing, a wool rowing suit for men in 1916. And, mm -hmm. you know, they, they needed that for warmth. And from there, that became, they, they got the demands for orders came with that, and then they got the idea that that was too heavy, and they developed this, this knit, um, this wool knit that, as um, uh, you said, Terry said, the, um, that, you know, stretched both ways, but it was Janssen that really developed that, um, and wool was the thing that would stretch like that. So I want to thank Kyle and thank Jan and Lisa. This has been so much fun for me. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Thanks for coming out on a rainy night. And uh, we will all continue to watch Boardwalk, correct? Yes, definitely. <laughs>